I'm Tiffany Garbett, Assistant Science Editor for DDN, and I'll be moderating our discussion. We have an exciting webinar planned for you today. Our speakers, Dr. Carl Peters, Mr. Mark Weinhold, and Dr. Dan Close, will be discussing how advanced plate readers and assay technologies move beyond high throughput endpoint studies to enable continuous monitoring of metabolic activity dynamics, transcriptional regulation, foreign gene expression, and cellular health. After the talk, Dr. Peters, Mr. Weinhold, and Dr. Dan Close will participate in a live Q&A session. To submit your questions or comments, simply submit your question to the Q&A portal to the right of your screen. We will try to get to as many of these as possible. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our webinar sponsor, BMG LabTech. BMG LabTech is specialized in producing microplate readers and is among the technology leaders in the field. The company's array of products include microplate readers for various research areas, applications, and budgets. BMG LabTech's top sellers are the Clario Star Plus and the Ferris Star FSX. Both devices are multi-mode microplate readers and represent the quality features of the company's instruments, which are highest sensitivity, flexibility, speed, and reliability. Our sponsor has provided us with some helpful handouts related to today's webinar. You can find and access these in our handout section located on the right side of your screen. And with that, let me introduce today's speakers. Dr. Carl Peters is a microplate reader senior application scientist at BMG LabTech. He obtained a PhD in cell and molecular biology from Northwestern University while studying protein kinase C signaling. He also has a BS in biology from Hastings College. Prior to BMG LabTech, he was an adjunct professor of biology at Roosevelt University and subsequently a clinical assistant professor in the School of Molecular Biosciences at Washington State University. He will be discussing the hardware enabling advanced discovery science before handing things over to Mr. Mark Weinhol and Dr. Dan Close of 490 Biotech, who will introduce us to the assays that take advantage of this equipment. Mr. Mark Weinhol is a lead scientist for cellular technologies at 490 Biotech. Mr. Weinhol obtained his graduate degree in cellular and developmental biology from the University of Connecticut, where his work focused on stem cell biology. His strong cell and molecular biology background led him to the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he applied this experience towards mammalian cell developmental biology, and then to the University of Tennessee, where he specialized in developing customized genetic modification tools for non-model systems. Mr. Weinhold joined 490 Biotech in 2019 to head cellular development. Dr. Dan Close is the Chief Scientific Officer of 490 Biotech a biotechnology company focused on developing autonomously bioluminescent assay solutions that function without luciferin treatment to continuously provide real-time data output. Dr. Close obtained his doctorate in genome science and technology from the University of Tennessee before serving as a postdoctoral research associate for the Joint Institute of Biological Sciences at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Following his postdoctoral assignment, Dr. Close was selected as a Eugene P. Wigner Fellow at the Department of Energy, where he leveraged his synthetic genetic pathway design exper experience to develop hydrocarbon biofuel production pathways in industrially relevant organisms. In 2018, he left this position to serve as the Chief Scientific Officer of 490 Biotech. Let's just take a minute to make sure your slides are up and running smoothly. And it looks like they are. Dr. Peters, please feel free to begin. Thank you, Tiffany. Um... It is really a pleasure to get a chance to speak, you to, speak to you today um, and to tell you a little bit about the advanced plate readers that are able to be employed in the use of uh, live cells for continuous output readings that give you real-time data and really give you um, just more information from the experiments that you're able to perform. And so from our point of view, what is required of a microplate reader for these types of assays is, number one, they have to keep the cells healthy, healthy during the assay. If the cell health is compromised in some way, obviously that is going to seriously impact what results you're actually seeing. Second, um, you want to have obviously the highest quality data, but if we can do anything to simplify the um, collection of that data, that's going to be all the better. And finally, if you can combine all of these things with useful data analysis, 
that will really streamline your approach and take you from beginning to end, from the very start of the assay to the, the data output and data analysis, that's going to provide you with a solution that's going to make the production of this data um, just seamless. So how do you keep cells healthy? Um, so the first thing that you need to need to consider is obviously most uh, most cells are going to be happy in particular environments, uh, and that starts with temperature. But temperature control is quite standard on most readers, and it certainly is on all BMG readers to be able to regulate temperatures up to 45 degrees C. Um, what can be added though, especially to the Clario Star Plus, is an atmosphere control capability. And this allows you to actively regulate the atmosphere conditions inside of the reader so that the prop appropriate carbon dioxide and oxygen levels are actually maintained within the reader. And in addition to just keeping cells healthy, we actually have the ability to um, kind of modify the environment and see what effect that that ha actually has on the cells as well. Similarly, you can do the same with, with temperature control and see if stressing the cells with temperature um, has any effect on the cell health or the output that, it, that you're looking at. And so what all of these things put together means is you can have real-time assessment of cells for their metabolism, their proliferation, basically the things that in indicate how healthy and um, viable and active a cell is at any particular time. So now let's move on to collection of high quality data. So with the, you want to be able to collect data as simply as po possible. And um, usually this, this can be um, it done in a number of ways, but you want to be able to very sensitively de perform detection. And that's especially important when you have cells that um, you know, are, of are oftentimes a, uh, a not a, not a distraction, but are are are, are going to have lead to uh, background issues and things of that nature. So the more sensitively you can actually detect the signal that is being produced, the better off you're going to be. And with that in mind, uh, BMG with the Claria Star readers introduced linear variable filter monochromators, uh, the most sensitive monochromator that is available due to the ability to have the highest transmission of light possible. And what you're really doing is essentially building a filter-like performance within the monochromator. And this allows you to have very high sensitivity and adjust the wavelengths and the band passes up to 100 nanometers of band pass. And they, this has proven to be also very excellent for performing scans, so excitation emission scans for fluorescence and, fluor and luminescence scans uh, for, for emission scans for luminescence. Another um, key to uh, high quality data collection is to be able to focus in on the appropriate place in the well to collect the data. This seems to be especially important uh, for cell-based assays, especially when the cells are adherent to the bottom of the well. And um, uh, our, our top selling readers, uh, the Claria Star and the Fair Star, um, have very sensitive uh, Z-height focus and um, that allows you to focus with a, a 0.1 millimeter resolution. And this really improves the sensitivity that you're able to attain from the top and the bottom. And as I said, uh, adherent cells um, are obviously going to be at the bottom of the well. So sometimes reading from the bottom is actually the most appropriate approach uh, for adherent type cells. Also with cellular cells, um, you cannot be 100% um, confident that one, the cells are going to be confluent and therefore spread out throughout the cells, but also the signal could vary from, from place to place throughout the cell. And so as a result of that, to enhance cell-based assays, we provide a number of well scanning options, uh, two that are, um, uh, are, are going to provide an average of what is happening in the well, that being orbital averaging and spiral averaging. But we also um, offer the ability to perform a matrix scan. And this allows you to have up to 900 data points per well and can actually allow you to localize where uh, cells are, are, are living and growing within the bottom of the well. 
we have also stepped up uh, uh, the ability to um, use red shifted fluorophores. Um, so the Claristar Plus is now available with separate detectors for fluorescence and for luminescence. Um, and what this allows us to do is to look at uh, further and further red shifted fluorophores. And that's quite important for cell based assays uh, to, get a, to try and get away from some of the competing uh, fluorescence that is usually in the more green range um, of the spectrum. Um, so with this combination, you're able to do this far red fluorescence, but also have the consistent um, low noise luminescent detection that you uh, have come to expect. And really this just means that you can perform any assay at any wavelength and be very uh, confident in the performance that you're getting from your reader. Another um, advancement with the Clary Star Plus that has made especially performance of these types of assays even easier is uh, the use of the, the capability that we call enhanced dynamic range. And this one leads to a, an expansion of the uh, luminescence and fluorescent range that you can actually see. So up to eight decades of detection in one, in one reading. And um, in addition, to provide more ease of use, there's uh, less need to optimize the, the detection settings. And this is especially useful in a kinetic assay where the signal is changing, um, especially increasing over time. Um, you have less of a chance that you're going to get signals that are out of range um, if you're using this enhanced dynamic range capability. And you know, comes, this comes together to provide uh, the industry leading sensitivity that we see with the Claria Star Plus. Um, another capability that we have uh, have had available for actually quite some time is to uh, the ability to perform multiplexing and assays. And so we have always we've for a very long time have had scripting capability, but we've continued to improve it and um, to make it more user friendly. And so now you can very easily using a script wizard combine up to three different read modes and um, actually perform comparisons of the plate layouts to make sure that everything is matched, matched up um, so that you can uh, proceed with your experiment and do the multiplexing assays that, that you want. So this is useful for obviously multiplexing, but also for assay optimization. You can, you can test out different techniques with different pr protocols, different integration times for uh, luminescence, say, and um, use that to um, really optimize things as you are moving along. Um, with the scripting capability, there's also the ability to change temperature, but also change the, the CO2 and O2, the carbon dioxide and uh, oxygen within the reader. So those capabilities that we were talking about with the ACU to uh, try and um, a, a modify the environment and see what effect that has, those things can all be worked into a script that uh, will allow you to walk away and, and, and see what happens um, uh, the next day or two. OK, so the final uh, kind of piece of the puzzle that would make this uh, uh, as complete of a package as possible is to have uh, useful data analysis tools. And BMJ Lab Tech has our microplate analysis and reduction software, or MARS, that provides just I mean, just a, a plethora of, of different capabilities that will allow you to view and analyze your data, but also um, change the layout so that you can specify different groups um, and to create standard curves or perform bar charts. Um, there's just really a, a, a large number of capabilities that are, that are built in. Um, most of the statistical analyses that you would want to perform a number of different fit curves that can be applied. Um, also, uh, assay quality parameters such as Z prime and signal to blank. All of these things are included, and really many, many more. And further included is the ability to actually create your own uh, your own user defined formulas. So, if there's something that we don't don't currently have, you can start to build in. Uh, the, uh, the the things that you really need uh, for based on uh, your your personal uh, data analysis needs. 
So um, just to sum up, the things that we feel are important in the plate reader technology side of things, um, you need to be able to keep yourself self healthy during the assay, and that is taken care of with uh, temperature control and the ACU. You want to simplify uh, the collection of data, and you want that data to be the highest quality. And so sensitivity is um, obtained with our LV, LVF monochrometer, uh, sensitive Z-height focus, dedicated detectors, and um, enhanced dynamic range. And the uh, cell, cell base capabilities are further enhanced through well scanning and the ability to uh, to really uh, multiplex things is incorporated with the script mode. And finally, as we just saw, the, the, the Mars data analysis package is um, just a, a really valuable tool that will allow you to take your, your, data, your data analysis and um, discovery to the next level. So um, just in closing, uh, I would like to, to share uh, this, this kind of uh, closing slide. So BMG has been around for, for 30, 30 years. And as our tagline say, says, we are the microplate, right? microplate reader company. Um, and to, that, to, that, to us, that means that we are really focused on creating the best instruments and you know, really allowing the scientists to max maximize uh, what they are able to do. So um, with that, I will now pass things along to, to uh, Mark and Dan at 490, and um, they are going to talk more now about the advanced assay technologies that are uh, available and how those have been implemented with, uh, with the BMG readers. Oops. All right, excellent. You know, thank you, Carl. That was a, a really good overview of the hardware capabilities that BMG's machines have. Um, now, I would like to welcome everybody to part two of our presentation, where we'll discuss the types of real-time assays and applications that can leverage that hardware to create advanced discovery workflows. Uh, so to get started, I'd like to just quickly introduce myself and my co-host for this part of today's presentation. I'm Dan Close, Chief Scientific Officer for 490 Biotech. Joining me is Mark Weinhold, our lead scientist for cellular technologies. Hello. Now, for those of you that may not be familiar with 490 Biotech, we develop continuously bioluminescent cellular technologies, which is a fancy way of saying that we spend our days finding new and improved ways to make cells glow so that you can get more information from the assays you're already using. Now, because 490 is heavily invested in assay development R&D, we have a ton of experience pushing the capabilities of BMG's plate readers. So this puts us in a great position to discuss how you can use them to expand your lab's capabilities as well. So before we get too in-depth, uh, I wanna just take a moment and make sure we're all on the same page about what it means for an assay to be real time. For us, this means meeting three pretty straightforward criteria. Number one, that cells remain healthy and viable throughout the assay. Number two, uh, that kinetic data can be recorded repeatedly or continuously from the same samples. And you know, I'd like to point out that this can be on any time scale. You know, whether you're incubating cells in the plate reader between readings with sub-second resolution or if you're returning them to the incubator for daily time points, you know, just so long as the cells don't stop reporting on your target of interest. And finally, uh, that additional tests can be performed on the samples either during or after the assay. Okay, uh, so this is obviously a lot different than a traditional in-point assay uh, where you know, your cells are killed or modified in a way that prohibits further data collection. Uh, most of you probably most familiar with this from the lysis step from bioluminescent assays. Uh, in some cases, in-point assays output signals are also either cumulative or independent of the current cellular state and this is common for absorbance assays, you know, where a substrate is converted over time, and then that total conversion is what you're actually recording at your time point of interest. Uh, and of course, in in-point assays, uh, cellular processing alters the samples in such a way as to prohibit 
further testing. A great example of this is how the chemical treatments for in-point bioluminescent assays can degrade RNA quality and make RT-PCR difficult or impossible. So, you know, I think it's pretty easy to see that uh, real-time assays have some pretty significant advantages, but for those of you who may be learning about them for the first time, I'm sure the first question that comes to mind is, when do I actually want to use these? Um, you know, since we manufacture them, I'm tempted to say always, um, but the real answer is that real-time assays tend to work best in the following situations. You know, when you are unsure when your target effect will occur, when you're unsure of the best time to perform data collection, either on your primary assay or a multiplexed secondary assay, when you believe it is possible the target effect can occur non-linearly, when there's a possibility that exposure to assay reagents can affect the outcome of the assay, um, and I'll talk in a slide or two about how uh, this is actually unique to 490's assays, the ability to, to remove this consideration, uh, when you want to perform multiple tests on the same samples, or when your treatment efficacy may be dynamic over time. Okay, so, you know, beyond knowing when to use them, there's also the question of what options are available. And this is actually pretty easy because there's really only three form formats. Uh, the first and oldest are fluorescent assays, um, you know, very standard. Hit these with an excitation signal, read back your emission signal, cells still there, nice and happy. Uh, next, we have traditional bioluminescence assays. Um, these are assays that use an external luciferase that then takes a proluciferin that's converted by the cell, and you get your traditional bioluminescent uh, activation. And, you know, finally, uh, the category that's closest to our hearts, uh, 490 Biotech's autobioluminescent assays. These are the newest format available, and they differentiate themselves from older bioluminescent assays because the reaction is fully contained within the cell. Now, as I said before, fluorescence is probably the oldest of the real-time assay formats, uh, and it really only works with viability assays um, for real-time. You have dead or dying cells that lose their membrane integrity and release intracellular components. The release of those intracellular metabolites is then used to power conversion of a profluorescent compound into a fluorescent uh, compound. And you can read the presence of that compound based on your excitation signal. And because of this format, these assays are still subject to the same limitations as traditional fluorescent assays, um, such as photo bleaching and high autofluorescent background. Uh, next up, the older traditional bioluminescence assays are probably what most of you are familiar with. Uh, so like the fluorescent assays, they're also limited to viability assays. Uh, but in this case, you have a luciferase and a proluciferin that are added to the culture medium. And that proluciferin is converted within living cells via an unknown reaction and excreted back into the media to interact with the luciferase. So in this type of situation, the amount of luciferase is held constant while your cell number can change throughout the assay. And because your luciferase and luciferin are housed in the medium, they're subject to degradation over time. But thankfully, this bioluminescence format still has an ultra low background, but there is always the chance that these, uh, these added luciferin chemicals can interfere with your study design. So this brings us to 490 Biotech's autobioluminescent assays. And we've built these assays from the ground up in order to improve upon the older external luciferase bioluminescent technology. You know, autobioluminescence is not just for viability. It actually supports multiple different assay types. In this case, the luciferase reaction occurs entirely within and is completely controlled by the cell which means that what you're seeing is actually the reporting of dynamic responses from individual cells across your full population. Uh, and this is available exclusively from 490 Biotech. So one of the keys to supporting multiple applications is being able to provide autobioluminescence in multiple formats. And practically, we do this by enabling both transient 
and stable expression of the autobioluminescent phenotype. You know, for simple and easy transient expression, we provide a ready to use assay mix. Um, and this can be introduced into any cell using any common transfection procedure. Then you simply have a short incubation while light output activates, and you can track that cell repeatedly or continuously for up to one week. Uh, in addition, we offer a variety of pre-made, stably autobioluminescent cell lines. Um, these are available in some of the most widely used cell types, so you can just pick them up and start working with them immediately. And in addition, uh, we also offer custom solutions. Uh, we're capable of creating specific autobioluminescent cell lines or assay mixes to fit any customer's need. So now I think it's important to note that uh, we've really designed this technology to work completely in the background uh, by leveraging minor quantities of abundant metabolites to produce and continuously recycle luciferin and by respecting the cell's natural compartmentalization of reducing power to fuel enzymatic reactions, we've been able to make autobioluminescent cells physiologically indistinguishable from their wild type counterparts. You know, despite being always active, autobioluminescent cells have the same growth rates as their wild type counterparts. Uh, they also show the same metabolic activity levels as wild type cells using traditional measurements such as ATP content. And they show the same passage by passage viability as wild type cells using traditional MTT viability assessment. In fact, uh, they don't really just perform the same as traditional endpoint assays, they often work even better. Uh, a great example of this is in 3D culture formats, where the use of autobioluminescence results in significantly better correlations between three-dimensional object size and light output than can be obtained using externally stimulated bioluminescence systems. And this is because unlike older bioluminescent assays that preferentially expose only the cells on the periphery of 3D structures to luciferin, 490 Biotech's autobioluminescent assay systems enable each cell of a three-dimensional population to produce light automatically and modulate that signal output in response to real-time physiological dynamics. And on top of that, uh, as I mentioned before, they, they offer a lot more flexibility in terms of what types of assays they support. So to talk about this variety of applications, I'd like to turn things over to Mark. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Dan. Uh, once again, I'm Mark, and I lead cellular technology development at 490 Biotech, and I have the pleasure of introducing you to advanced assays that are enabled by our technology. So I'm going to walk you through specific examples of data that we've generated in-house for ourselves, for clients, and for collaborators. And before I bring up the list of assays here, I just want to point out that some of these assays are going to be highlighted with an asterisk, and that's just to note assays that are unique to 490 Biotech. So first, we're going to look at transfection optimization and pre-assay profiling. Then we'll move on to real-time metabolic activity and toxicity monitoring, followed by chronic exposure adaptation and viability monitoring, target monitoring within a mixed consortia, transcriptional activity monitoring, and finally, we'll look at multiplexed assays. So out of all these assay types, my personal favorite is number one, uh, transfection optimization and pre-assay pro profiling. Um, this is something I do a lot in the lab, and it really shows the power of the internal luciferase system. It illustrates how easy it is to set up an assay, and it gives you a ton of information on an, the uh, expression profile of any given cell type using any, uh, any promoter or any gene of interest. Uh, so Dan, do you have a, a favorite? Yeah, you, you're going to put me on the spot here. Um, I think I, probably transcriptional activation uh, monitoring is, is my favorite use of this technology. Right, so number five. All right, well, let's uh, jump into the details here and see what excites us about these assays. So first, we're going to look at transfection optimization and pre-assay profiling. So this type of assay allows us to quickly determine expression timing. So we can see when expression starts. We can see how long it takes to get to peak expression, and we can see the duration of that expression profile. Uh, we can also look at transfection efficiency uh, through, through reagent screening, and also look at delivery efficiencies. And then finally, you can take all that information and determine when is, uh, when's the best time to perform any type of follow-up experiment. So first, we're going to look at transfections and HEKs. 
Uh, uh, so HEKs are a common cell type, uh, very easy to transfect. And here we're looking at four different transfection reagents. So as Dan mentioned, these assays are extremely easy to set up. All it is is taking your transfection um, reagent of choice, mixing it with our pre-assay mix, adding that mix to your cells, loading it in the plate reader, and walking away and coming back to it. Uh, alternatively, what's beautiful um, here is you can watch this happen in real time, although you're probably not going to want to sit there for 72 hours and watch this data come in, but the option is there if you'd like to do that. <clears throat> so our technology uses light output as a readout for gene expression. Um, and so here you can see reagents. We have reagents 3, uh, 3, 4, and 1, which give a very robust expression profile. And compared to these, reagent 2 is uh, lacking in that front. Uh, reagent 2 expression also comes down much earlier, uh, same with reagent run 1. So if I was moving forward with an experiment uh, in HEKs, I would probably transfect with reagent 4. Uh, next, we'll move on to a couple more difficult to transfect cell types. So first, we'll look at induced pluripotent stem cells. So here, there's a clear winner, reagent 3. It gives a very robust expression profile. Uh, expression ramps up much earlier than the others, uh, and it also peaks at a much higher level uh, than the other types. I uh, just want to point out here too, region 2, although the expression level doesn't achieve uh, that of region 3, it has a very stable expression profile overall. So that might be more of interest to you depending on the type of experiments you're going to be running. And finally, we're going to look at cardiomyocytes. So cardiomyocytes are a notoriously difficult cell to transfect. Uh, these cells are differentiated from iPSCs over uh, roughly a two-week period. So iPSCs are plated. Uh, taken through the differentiated process, and at the end of the two weeks, we have cardiomyocytes. So these cells have been in the same plate, in the same well, you're going to transfect for a long time. Um, these cells are also post-mitotic, and that's very difficult for a lot of transfection reagents to get in. Most reagents you know, recommend transfecting your cells 24 hours after plating them. But here things start to get really interesting. You can see a lot of dynamic expression profiles going on here. Uh, reagent 2 gives us the highest expression profile. Uh, and if you remember, the in the previous two cell types, reagent 2 was either the lowest or the second to lowest as far as uh, uh, expression output. Uh, reagent 3 turns on much earlier than the others. Uh, and then reagents 1 and 4 give a fairly stable expression profile over time. So these data really illustrate how simple, uh, how the simple assay gives you a lot of insight into when you may, may want to perform additional experiments, um, whether it be in combination with our assay mix or using your gene or genes of interest. Um, so typically, when we're going to be running assays in the lab, we start off with this assay, uh, assay profiling to determine, determine what is the best time to uh, look at our cells uh, within any given assay. Next, we're going to be moving on to real-time metabolic activity and toxicity monitoring. So here, we're able to see changes in cellular health as they happen in real time. So does the met metabolic activity increase, decrease, or does it stay the same? Uh, we can track changes in cellular population sizes. So this works great in, in 2D and 3D formats. And then we can also see the response to chemical or physical interventions without disturbing the cells. So once again, this is another easy assay to set up. So you can either use our stable autobioluminescent cells and plate them in a multi-well plate, or you can plate your cells of choice and transfect with our pre-assay mix. You can then treat your cells, put them in a plate reader, walk away, and come back to some beautiful data. Uh, this is a great example of when you may want to use atmospheric control on your plate reader. Uh, so your cells are going to think they're hanging out in the incubator, sitting at 37 degrees uh, with 5% CO2, and they have no idea they're being assayed. Another real cool feature of some of the BMG plate readers is some of them can come equipped with a pump for reagent injection. So you can actually treat your cells directly in the plate reader. So this allows you to get readings pre-treatment and post-treatment without having to pull your plate out, exposing your cells to ambient temperature, uh, so it really minim minimizes the amount of disturbance your cells go through. So that's a very cool feature um, with the play readers. Uh, moving on to the first example here. So here we're looking at a kill curve using our technology. So we're using the antibiotic zeaxanthin, And at lower concentrations, zeaxanthin slightly decreases the metabolic activity of our cells. And at higher concentrations, it significantly decreases the metabolic activity and ultimately killing the cells at the highest, uh, highest concentrations. Uh, you know, for a typical kill curve, the number of readings we have here is very excessive. We're taking a reading every 30 minutes. Uh, so for your standard kill curve, you might want to look at 24 hours or 48 hours. So what Dan had mentioned earlier, you can leave your cells in the incubator, pull them out for uh, looking at them at a specific point in time and put them back in. So that really opens up your plate reader to be running other assays that people may want to be using in the lab. Uh, but if you choose, you can collect readings uh, pretty much however, 
however frequently you want to be uh, collecting them. Next, we'll move on to an example where collecting information frequently uh, can be very beneficial. So here we're looking at uh, treatment of cells with a anti-tumor pharmaceutical elliptocene. So at lower concentrations, you can see the, the purple line there, elliptocene increases metabolic activity by uncoupling oxidative phosphorylation. And at higher concentrations, the red line, you can see it induces cytotoxicity by depleting the availability of ATP. <clears throat> and you can see over time, elliptocene is metabolized within the cell. So the metabolic state of the cells goes from a negative to a positive over time. So just due to the fact that we can monitor metabolism over time, in this case, we can see the magnitude of the impact and the timing of that impact. And we can be confident that we're not missing any key, um, any key timing features um, within there. Yeah, and you know what I, I really like about this is, uh, you know, besides being a super easy way to track metabolic response, uh, this, is, this is really kind of like an easy hack for running pro-drug studies in a plate reader. I know you're going to talk about mixed consortium monitoring later, but uh, this ability to monitor the timing and effect of breakdown products uh, is just so easy with this approach. I mean, here we're doing that with one type of cell, but we could easily co-culture one bioluminescent and one non-luminescent population, and then we could ID any potential pro-drug effects on the same plate as this test. And, and what I really like about our technology is that you can really maximize the, the use of your hardware. So typically plate readers aren't being used overnight or even less likely being used over the weekend. And personally, I'm almost always running assays during those times and it leaves the plate reader open during the day when uh, people are here for running other types of assays. And there's nothing better than setting up an assay at the end of the day Friday, coming back to data on Monday and uh, you know already feeling accomplishment at the beginning of your week. So our technology allows for a lot of flexibility and puts you in, puts the control in your hands. You know how much time do you want to use up your plate readers for versus how much time you or how many time points you want to collect data for uh, for your particular assay. So it's just a really great opportunity for maximizing uh, workflows in your lab. Next, we're going to be moving on to chronic exposure adaptation and viability monitoring. Uh, so this is great for understanding environmental effects. Uh, so we can understand compound effects over many generations or many passages. We can learn about how cells respond to prolonged exposure. And like we mentioned in the last slide and Dan talked about earlier, cells can be stored at the in the incubator between readings. So this type of assay is typically set up for a very long time course. So a couple of weeks, a couple of months, maybe even a couple of years, depending on what you're, uh, what type of assay you're running or what what, what questions you're trying to answer. Um, so this type of assay also pairs very well with cell counting, fluorescence transcriptional bioreporters, QRT, PCR, and a host of other assays that we'll talk about later on. So for this specific example here, this is data we generated for a client of ours. Uh, and what we did is we used our stable autobioluminescent HEP-G2 liver cells, and we chronically exposed them to a pesticide. So how we set this up is we plated the cells at a specific density, and at each passage, we counted and plated the cells at that same density again. Uh, and then the cells that would normally be thrown out, we put those into a plate reader and we got the, the uh, metabolic or the output of the real metabolic activity of the cells at that given point in time. Um, so just to walk through this data real quick here, at the end of a week, we saw a significant increase in metabolic activity. At weeks two and three, we saw a significant decrease. And by the end of a month, the cells were able to adapt um, to the, or to the treatment and return to normal metabolic activity. So that's one thing that really excites me about this type of experiment um, is there's virtually no extra effort or money that needs to be expended uh, to get these readings beyond what you would normally commit to passaging and counting your cells. So really the only extra cost to you since these cells are stably expressing our, our technology is the multi-well plate they use to, to stick into the plate reader. Uh, so there are no extra reagents needed for downstream processing. No need to worry about downstream processing uh, interfering the with the metabolic activity of your cells. Um, so just in general in the lab, the experiments are expensive and time consuming. So anything that can be done to cut back on both those fronts is a huge bonus. Yeah, you're right. I mean, this is, this is a great example of how we can add value to an existing assay with minimal burden on personnel or equipment. Because uh, this was, what, like an extra two minutes of your time to, to run these assays? I mean, if we were a, a full... CRO, Gary, uh, I'm sorry, our boss uh, would would absolutely be pushing this as a value add upgrade and billing for it, you know, when all it really costs us is a, a few extra minutes. 
And you know, since I'm interrupting you again, sorry. Um, let me also just add real quick that we concluded this experiment at one month, uh, since that's when metabolism stabilized. But our record for bioluminescent measurement from one of our stable autobioluminescent lines is actually just over a hundred passages. Uh, so. At that point, we actually gave up. Uh, we figured that at 100 passages, uh, even the most hardcore academic would have probably switched to a fresh batch of cells. Uh, so yeah, I guess what I'm trying to say is uh, you can run these types of assays over pretty much any time scale you want. Right, and any anything that can cut down the amount of hands-on time I have to spend in the lab is great. Uh, it really minimizes the chance of human error uh, er entering into your experiment. So. Well, next we're gonna move on to target monitoring within a mixed consortia. So this is only possible with an internal luciferase system. Um, and this is just due to the fact that the internal uh, luminescence reaction takes place within your cell of interest. So you can have a mixture of cells, uh, a mixture comprised of any cell type, so human or animal cells paired with eukaryotic, fungal, or bacterial. You can also see variations within a population um, in response to physical or chemical dynamics. Uh, so to run this type of assay, we actually utilize BMG's well scanning technology, uh, specifically matrix scanning that Carl talked about earlier. Um, so here we're looking at four wells of a six well plate. And these wells were plated with mixed populations of cells, a small subset of which contained our internal luciferase system. Uh, and here you can easily identify uh, populate, uh, autobioluminescent populations. So if you look at the wells, two wells on the right side, you can easily identify three populations within them. Uh, and here, using BMG software, this is just another way to visualize this data and gives you a better idea of your signal to noise, uh, your signal to noise within your uh, experiment, which is great. Yeah. And personally, I'm really excited to uh, to see when what people do when merging these two technologies. Um, I mean, I can see a, a ton of different experiments being run, such as wound healing, scratch assays, or other regenerative medicine assays. Uh, you can monitor cell migration or look at spheroid formation. So really, the possibilities are endless. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's just a ton you can do with mixed consortia. Um, and I'd also like to point out that you're not really limited to just mammalian cells here either. Um, so this work actually grew out of some early experiments where we were trying to measure gut cell response to E. coli 0157H7 infection. And we had originally tried using fluorescent reporters in the human cells, uh, but the E. coli was too autofluorescent. Uh, so we switched to firefly luciferase, um, but the lysis step was releasing ATP from both the human and bacterial uh, cells, which kind of put our results like all over the place. So we ended up actually running our first mixed consortia experiments using autobioluminescent human cells and unlabeled E. coli, and it worked great. I mean, we could actually track the human cell metabolic activity dynamics in response to infection, and then even watch their return to baseline as we cleared that infection uh, with antibiotic treatment. Yeah, I mean, so there, there are a lot of exciting possibilities um, here. Uh, next, we're gonna move on to your favorite assay type. So we're gonna look at or tr transcriptional activity monitoring. So this is great for understanding the effects of different treatments on a target gene or pathway. It provides information on the timing of activation, deactivation, uh, the magnitude of transcriptional change, effect duration and baseline expression dynamics. So here we're gonna be looking at a detoxification biomarker in response to a compound challenge. So typically this type of experiment would be set up using an endpoint assay or QRT PCR. Uh, in both cases, you're only looking at a snapshot, uh, snapshot in time. So if you wanna increase your resolution over time, you're just setting up that many more assays uh, and it's driving up the cost and the amount of uh, personnel hours to process those assays. So typically you would set this assay up, assay at six hours using a different plate at 12 hours, a different plate at 18, and yet another plate at 24 hours. So I'd like to point out here, we're looking at every six hours. So that means someone in the lab is gonna have to come in outside of work hours to be able to process these samples. Uh, and then also once you compile all this information, you can't really be confident that you're catching all the key time points. So you might be missing out on something, uh, a very key time point. So using our technology, once again, it's very simple. You set up your assay, you walk away from it, you follow the same population of cells over time. And here you can see in this specific example, our technology was able to identify a key uh, moment in transcriptional activity, which was completely missed by the standard endpoint assay. Um, so with our technology, you can be confident that you're not missing out on any key um, moment in time. 
Uh, for the next next example, we're going to be looking at NF kappa B activation in response to doxorubicin challenge. So here, these cells are transi transiently transfected with our technology, uh, treated with doxorubicin, and here we can see identify the point when induction takes place, the magnitude of that induction, and when the signal begins to fade. So this looks similar to a lot of the pre-assay uh, transfections that we were doing before. It gives you a beautiful profile, and you're able to go in and and assay your your population at a specific point in time, um, whatever whatever your research interests um, are looking for. Yeah, and uh, like I said before, this is definitely my favorite application for our technology. Uh, you know, I remember as a graduate student just running tons of QRQs. I mean, I. I didn't want to think about how much I must have cost my PI. I would be in there at random hours, harvesting cells, hoping I was catching the exact time point that I needed for transcriptional activation. And now I would just hit them with a custom assay mix for my gene of interest, toss them in our Clario star, and call it a day. You know, maybe that's just a sign that I'm getting too old to be a good bench scientist, but uh, I'm, I'm not going back to the old way again. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, experiments and assays have been made extremely easy to use. Uh, so finally, we're going to be moving on to multi multiplex assays. So this is going to show you how compatible our system is with many types of assays out there, and it allows for nearly unlimited multiplexing opportunities. Uh, this allows our system to tie in easily or complement assays you're already working with, and they can help broaden your understanding of the systems you're already working in. So our autobioluminescent signal ceases immediately upon cell death. This means there's going to be no crosstalk between assays, no reagents to interfere with downstream assays. Our luciferin is composed of recycled intercellular metabolites, so endpoint bioluminescent assays can still be used, and cells remain in their native physiological state. I'd like to point out the only assay type you cannot run concurrently with our technology would be a GFP-based system. And this is just due to the fact that our autobioluminescent signal and GFP have a similar emission wavelength, um, so we can't distinguish them. However, you can run a GFP-based assay uh, sequentially with our system. So collect all your bioluminescent readings. Once the cells are harvested and processed for downstream assay, our, our signal is gone and you're able to look at the GFP freely. So. Our system is really versatile uh, and can be added to any workflow, wh whether you're already using endpoint assays to combine with them or looking at uh, simultaneous assays that you're going to, that, that you want to take part in with our technology. Um, so finally, I'm just going to summarize. Um, we have at 490 bio, our 490 Biotech's internal luciferase based real time approaches significantly enhance the amount of data you can obtain from a reader, uh, plate reader based system. Transfection-based assays and stable, continuously bioluminescent cells offer flexibility for a variety of applications. Multiple real-time assay formats are available to meet the needs of different labs. Real-time approaches can replace most common endpoint assays and are especially well-suited for early-stage R&D. Uh, and pairing high data output assay with the right equipment is essential for developing a complete understanding of the system you're working with. So please don't be afraid to reach out to us if you're new to real-time assays or if you have any questions about how to use them in your work. Uh, that's it for me. I'm going to kick it back over to Dan to close us out. Great. Thanks, Mark. Um, you know, and again, thanks to Carl from BMG. Thanks to DDN for hosting us. And of course, a big thank you to everyone who took the time to learn from us today. Um, I know we're just about to open things up for questions, but before we close, uh, I just want to reiterate what Mark said. You know, we've spent years pushing the limits of BMG's plate readers. And besides being super impressed with them, uh, we really have learned a ton about what they can do. So if you have any questions about how to really leverage the capabilities of this equipment, uh, and of course, if you have any questions about 490 Biotech's autobioluminescent technology, and you don't get a chance to ask them today, please feel free to reach out later. Uh, we're always happy to help. And with that, I'd like to just thank everyone once again, um, throw things back to Tiffany and open us up for questions. Fantastic talk. talk. Thank you, Dr. Peters, Dr. Weinhold, and Dr. Close. The audience don't, to the audience, don't forget to submit your questions for the speakers in the Q&A tab to the right of your screen. Now, in the time we have left, let's get to our listeners' questions. Our first question is for Dr. Peters. Is this technology affected by the type of media used? For example, with phenol red? So, um, 
yeah, I mean, definitely phenol red is uh, known uh, for its autofluorescent capacity. So um, any any type of fluorescent assay that is going to be in that same sort of green range um, is going to be affected by um, going to be affected by phenol red. Um, I mean, I think that with the 490 biotech technology, um, you you get around that. Um, but if you are looking for looking at a fluorescent output, then certainly uh, phenol red would would be uh, impacting these results. Thank you. Our next question is for Mr. Weinholt and Dr. Close. Is there a functional difference between the transient and the stable autobioluminescence? And can you speak a little bit to when one might be more applicable to experiment versus the other? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. Um, so functionally, uh, they, they provide the exact same output. Um, so you could use them interchangeably in a lot of situations. Um, we recommend using the transient for a lot of discovery based things where you're going to be going at higher throughput and when you're going to be looking across a variety of different cell types, uh, because then you can apply those all simultaneously on plate, uh, look at multiple cell types at the same time. We recommend the stable expression for the prolonged, so multi passage level experiments, or if you're uh, with a company or a research lab that focuses on one specific tissue type, having a stable cell of that type allows you to, uh, to do a lot of multiplexing on that tissue as well. Great, thank you. Our next question is for Dr. Peters. What about the opacity of the bottom of the plate? Does that affect the signal in any way? Do you need to use a certain type of plate for this um, instrumentation? Um, so the only time you would have to change anything is if you were choosing to um, work with bottom reading. Obviously, then you would have to use a clear clear bottom plate. But these are available from uh, just about every manufacturer that is out there and in all the different types of plates as well. So with black walls, with white walls, um, whichever one that you want. I should point out that um, I think that with our ability to perform... Uh, you know, very sensitive Z height focusing. Um, in a lot of uh, in a lot of experiments, reading from the top uh, is able to focus on that on those cells that are at the bottom of the well. Um, so you know, it's one of those situations where you know you kind of have to try it out to see which is uh, you know which is best for your particular assay. But yeah, certainly if you're doing bottom reading, then you need to find a, a clear bottom option. Great, but there. It will work with both glass and plastic. Do is that correct? That's absolutely correct. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you don't have to spend all the money for the glass bottom plates. There are a lot of high quality uh, clear plastic options out there as well. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Peters. Our next question is for Mr. Weinhole and Dr. Close, and I, I'll start with Mr. Weinhole. Are there any negative or toxic effects of the autobioluminescence, and will it work with all cell types? You you've shown us quite a variety of cell types, but will it work for everything? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, so Dan kind of walked through the specific examples uh, through the in the PowerPoint presentation showing that there are no negative effects of our bioluminescent signal on cell health or cell physiology. So it's really running in the background and is not going to impact your cellular health in any way or impact your assay, um, assay down the road. And then for the second question, um, I'm not sure if there's any cell types that we haven't been able to successfully get our, our system to work in, but we've worked in a, a large variety of uh, primary cells, um, cancerous cells, um, yeah, stem cells. Yeah, I think uh, the, the politically correct answer to that question is we have, we have yet to find a cell type that it does not work with, um, which pretty much, if we say it works with everything, I guarantee somebody's going to find the one <laughs> cell that doesn't like it for some reason. Uh, but it has, been, uh, it has been very, very versatile in our hands. That's awesome. Thank you, guys. Dr. Peters, what is the maximum well plate that can be used with these readers? Um, so the maximum uh, well plate for our Ferristar is uh, three, three, four, five, six wells. So 3,456 wells. Um, for the Claria Star, um, it's 1536. Um, and I, I mean, I we do have some 
experience, even with cell base assays in 1536 well plates. Uh, but I would, I would get, I would hazard a guess that most people aren't going to be going much over 384 for the the plate types that they would use. Great, thank you, Dr. Peters. Another one for you. Can trans well plates be reliably measured within this system as well? Yes. Um, so, I mean, it actually provides a fairly unique um, situation um, where, uh, again, with the scripting capability, you could set up an assay that was one that was reading from the bottom to uh, gather the bottom of the well, and then another reading that was taking place from the top that would actually uh, read what was, what was happening on the insert. And um, because of the way that the system works with the 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 the, the Z height focusing, um, you know those would be independently read, um, and you could gather information on both sides of the trans well uh, insert. Thank you, Mr. Weinhol and Dr. Close. Can you speak a little bit about um, using the software for analysis in all these variety of experiments? Yeah, um, we've 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 loved it. Um, you know, we obviously have built our technology to be very multiplex compatible, um, which means that we're often looking at our autobioluminescent output along with uh, a fluorescent signal in the same well, or you know, afterwards an endpoint bioluminescent uh, signal. So we we use those scripting capabilities in order to hit each well with uh, multiple tests and. You know, I know, Mark, you really like the, the flexibility that we can run these either uh, in series per well or in series per plate. So we can scan through, you know, do bioluminescence, fluorescence, especially for um, things with very high resolution. Uh, we've done fluorescent pH change, uh, redox state change uh, experiments as well. And uh, those we like to run bioluminescence immediately followed by fluorescence at a per well level. Other times, you know, you're interested in just uh, saying, okay, we're going to use bioluminescence to look at viability, and uh, we have a fluorescent reporter for our gene of interest, and then we don't care so much. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll scan through a whole plate doing bioluminescence uh, and then go back and take a, a fluorescent gene of interest measurement. Yeah, and on the, the front of data analysis as well, um, the BMG software offers a lot there. Um, as well, so we're able to easily switch between raw data collected, blank, blank correct, or uh, blank corrected data, um, doing averaging, um, uh, looking at statistics. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunities there as well. Yeah, and uh, Carl put it as one bullet point in his part of the slide, but the <laughs> ability to customize, you know, your data analysis on machine and and just have it spit out, you know, ready to roll assay results. Uh, we personally thought deserved more than one bullet point, Carl. That was a, a pretty fun. We use that all the time. Well, I'm sorry that I uh, undersold that. Uh, <laughs> is, uh, there's, uh, I mean, it, it it is something that I think is uh, you know very a very useful uh, piece of piece of piece to the puzzle. Um, but I mean, it does get overshadowed, um, you know, by you know kind of kind of the the higher higher more glamorous uh, and more I guess instrument-based uh, types of types of innovation that we've done, so. Right, and well, just the ability to look at your, your data coming in in real time. Like, I'm always hopping over uh, to the Clario Star and looking at <laughs> what my numbers are at, so it allows a lot of flexibility there, too. Yeah, we, we've definitely stopped experiments early when we realized that we forgot to add something. <laughs> right. <laughs> we have no response from our treatment right. well. Oh, wow, yep. that's fantastic. Thank you guys. So you spoke a little bit during the presentation about this, but do you at all find like that there's a point of exhaustion either in the autobioluminescence or or in how long you can perform these visualization experiments? And this is for Mr. Weinhold and Dr. Close. Yeah, uh, for the transient experiments, yes, uh, because you know we're we're subject to how long transient expression uh, occurs, and we do see some differences by cell type. Um, you know, we've taken those up over a week in some cell types, uh, but you do see a, a ramp up in the beginning of those assays and a ramp down for the autobioluminescent signal towards the end of those assays. Uh, the nice thing is that's very consistent across samples. Um, so usually we're just comparing to an untreated control and doing our normalization there. 
if you needed to, you could cut those tails off. Uh, and I think that goes back to, you know, Mark's favorite aspect of this for assay design. We can, you know, we can toss a, a, a transient mix into a cell, throw it in over a weekend, and now we know exactly what that profile is going to look like. Fantastic. That, that is super awesome. Unfortunately, we have time for just one more question, and I'm going to direct it to all of you guys, and we'll start with um, Mr. Weinhold and Dr. Close first. Mr. Weinhold, what is the greatest advantage or convenience about um, this technology altogether, the plate reader and autobiolumescence? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I could go on forever of, about that, but for me personally, it's just the the how little of hands-on time I actually need. It, it takes very little input from me. So you could, you know, have someone in the street come up, come come in, and you give them some basic uh, a tutorial on how to pipette, and they could set up a set up a an assay, um, and it, it would <laughs> it would come out come out beautifully. So for me, the the biggest thing is how our technology paired with BMG's plate reader how it really simplifies. Um, assay, uh, how you conduct an assay. So yeah, it's just very simple. Yeah, yeah, yeah I love the, the simplicity and uh, I'll, I'll say the, the flexibility. You know, I, we just joked about it, but the ability to, you know, watch this stuff occurring continuously and to do those types of real real time data analysis is fantastic. You know, I don't know how many times we've set something up and said, okay, you know, what we care about here is EC50 treatment you know, or IC50 treatment. And to be able to toss that on a plate reader and then go exactly when that point occurs and go in for our, you know, more extensive, more expensive testing instead of just saying, yeah, I don't know, that's probably going to be 24 hours, probably going to be 48 hours. Um, so the flexibility that it offers to uh, to make adjustments to, to assays that you're running or to append further assays uh, is probably my favorite aspect. Great. Dr. Peters, would you like to, to add anything to that question? Well, I think that um, Mark touched on this, um, and this is something that we've heard from, you know, multiple different people is, uh, you know, the ability to set up something, you know, on a Friday night, um, you know, go home, have a, have an enjoyable weekend, not really think about your, your, your work and come in on Monday morning and you've, you've already, you've already had a successful week. Um, and so, um, you know, to be able to just walk away from the experiment and, um, you know, know that it's, uh, that it's doing, doing all the work for you, the, the, the reader is doing its job and the assay technology is doing its job and you're, you're, you're gathering results while, while you're having a beer. So, um, <laughs> so that I think is, you know, what, what people really like. Yep, indeed. Making the lab become more productive. Absolutely. Well, that's that's all the time we have for today. If you have any further questions for our speakers, please consider reaching out to the speakers directly. Their email addresses are shown on the screen. As a reminder, the webinar will be archived on the DDN website, and you will receive an email notifying you when the webinar is available on demand. On behalf of DDN, I would like to thank our speakers, Mr. Carl, Dr. Carl Peters, Mr. Mark Weinhol, and Dr. Dan Close, as well as our sponsor, BMG LabTech, and of course, our thanks to you for listening. Goodbye, everyone, and have a great rest of your day.